on World News Tonight. Stern warnings. The United States is not backing down and holding Russia and its possible allies accountable for the chaos in Ukraine, as the global superpower has now confronted China on its alleged support of Russia's actions, claiming dire consequences. Change of plans. The unending sanctions on Russia's economy is now beginning to affect other nations dependent on the country. Oil prices soar to new highs and to counter the status quo, the EU strategizes new routes of punishment. Mounting infections. China is on a COVID relapse as the country grapples with caseloads not seen since the beginning of the pandemic. Along with this, the country continues to see an economic decline as lockdowns are reimposed. And mega marathon. Switzerland sees thousands of skiing enthusiasts take to the slopes of snow in marking the return of an epic showdown. This is Adha Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening. Thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We begin tonight's broadcast with updates on the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Top officials from the U.S. and China have met in Rome to discuss Russia's ongoing invasion of Ukraine. During marathon talks in Italy, Washington warned Beijing that any support for Moscow's aggression against its southeastern neighbor will result in consequences. Tight security outside this hotel in Rome marked the high-stakes diplomacy inside. U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan pressed Washington's message on a Chinese diplomat, asking Beijing not to take additional actions to support Moscow amid the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The White House described the seven-hour sit-down between Sullivan and Yang Jiechi as intense, reflecting what it called the gravity of the moment. Sullivan warned China of the economic penalties and global isolation it would face if it continues to support Russia in its invasion of Ukraine. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki. Should they provide military or other assistance uh, that, of course, violates sanctions or, uh, or supports the war effort, uh, that there will be uh, significant consequences. But in terms of what those specifics look like, we would coordinate with our partners and allies to make that determination. Psaki said the meeting had been scheduled for some time, adding, uh, it was a timely uh, and important moment uh, to have this conversation. It took place as the U.S. told allies in NATO that China had signaled its willingness to provide military and economic aid to Russia to support its war. But China on Monday said reports of such a request from Russia was merely U.S. disinformation. Russia, too, denied it had asked China for military assistance and said it had sufficient military clout to fulfill all of its aims in Ukraine. U.S. officials and allies have tried to make clear to Beijing in recent weeks that siding with Russia could carry consequences for trade flows, development of new technologies, and could expose it to secondary sanctions. China, a key trading partner of Russia, has refused to call Moscow's actions an invasion, although China's President Xi Jinping last week did call for maximum restraint and expressed concern about the impact of Western sanctions on the global economy. Ukraine and Russia began another round of talks, even as fierce Russian bombardments continued and the Ukrainian refugee exodus reached 28 million. The Ukrainian military on Monday released video of what it said were its soldiers battling Russian troops on the outskirts of Kyiv as the Russian invasion creeped closer to the country's capital. Monday morning, residents were shocked when a Russian bombardment shattered an apartment block and demolished buses, killing at least two. One person was gone. It was an old man around 70. Then emergency services arrived. They tried to save another injured female, but she was also dead. Ukraine reported more airstrikes on an airport in the west in addition to heavy shelling on the outskirts of Kyiv and attacks in the southern town of Mykolaiv, where Ukraine's forces have mounted a counterattack. In this Kyiv auto repair shop, the mechanics are repairing and refitting weapons captured from Russian vehicles so that they can be turned against the invaders. We collected a team of welders, engineers, we gave them drafts, we familiarized ourselves with the drafts, we made a prototype model and it worked. The embattled nation's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, posted to social media that one of Russia's war aims was to destroy Ukraine's economy. Economic suppression of Ukraine is one of the war's goals against us today. We have to resist this as well. Save our economy, save our people. 
That is why the government has been asked to work out details on how to restore small and medium business. But in the midst of the conflict, both sides on Monday participated in what the Ukrainian representative called hard negotiations. The Russian invasion, which Moscow calls a special military operation, is the largest ground war in Europe since 1945 and has created some 2.8 million refugees. Russia continues to deny targeting civilians, saying its mission is to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine, which Ukraine and Western allies call a baseless pretext for war. Ukraine's ambassador to the United Nations, Sergei Kislytsia, accused Russia of war crimes Monday, comparing the Kremlin to the Nazis they have said they seek to eradicate. Russian troops continue to commit war crimes and crimes against humanity in Ukraine, erasing any difference with their Nazi predecessors 80 years ago. Cities and, and villages destroyed to the ground, mass graves, terror against civilians in the occupied territories, abduction and killing of representatives of local authorities, activists and journalists. Talks between Russian and Ukrainian officials will continue on Tuesday. Marina Ovesyanikova, a producer at Russian state TV channel 1, interrupted a live news bulletin on the channel, holding up a sign behind the studio presenter and shouting slogans denouncing the war in Ukraine. She could face up to five years in prison and Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky thanked her for her support. It lasted all of four seconds. TV producer Marina Ovskinakova jumps behind the presenter on Russia's state-run Channel 1 to speak out against the invasion of Ukraine before the newscast abruptly cuts away. Assuming she would be taken into custody by the police, she recorded a video beforehand to be sure her message reached the Russian public. What is happening in Ukraine now is a crime. Russia is the aggressor, and the responsibility lies with one person only, Vladimir Putin. Since the Russian invasion of Ukraine began, the Kremlin has outlawed truthful reporting on the conflict, using the words invasion or war is against the law. Protesting the war will also land you in jail. Police arrested more than 4,000 people who took part in anti-war demonstrations across Russia just on Sunday. Even this man, who held up a blank piece of paper, was taken into custody. He was told that even single picket protests were illegal. The Kremlin has blocked social media sites such as Facebook and Twitter, and many Russians remain in the dark about what's happening in Ukraine. It's why Marina Avsenikova felt it was so important to speak out in such a public fashion. Only we, intelligent and thinking Russian people, have the power to stop this madness. Go and protest. Have no fear. They can't put us all in jail. A call to action that comes with a price. She now faces up to five years in prison. The economy of the U.S. is facing turmoil, and U.S. President Joe Biden blamed soaring inflation on supply chain issues and Russian President Vladimir Putin's decision to invade Ukraine. Let's cross over to other day on the world news special correspondent Nikola Senaratna from New York in the U.S. for more. Nikola. Yes, Senarabi. Biden's speech comes as U.S. households are coping with the fastest pace of price increases in 40 years, and policymakers are watching closely to see if the shock will lead to higher inflation expectations. The Russian invasion of Ukraine, which has led to higher fuel price increases, may lead to increase in food costs and add more uncertainty to the outlook. A measure of market-based U.S. inflation expectations showed that the near-term forecast jumped sharply in respect to government data and shows that the inflation is running at a rate of 7% and rose again after the Russian attack. Long-term inflation expectations inched higher following the Russian invasion. Fed officials are expected to take a key step to fight against inflation by raising interest rates from near zero levels, roughly two years after they slashed rates in response to the coronavirus pandemic. The US economy is on most stable footing now with the unemployment rate at 3.8% and wage rising. But most households are also struggling with the rising cost. 
Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you. That was other than a world news special correspondent, Nikola Sena Ratna from New York in the US. In a sign of concerns about the impact of sanctions on oil prices and supplies, EU governments have clarified that new sanctions on Russian oil majors will not prevent states and companies from buying oil from Russian oil majors. The EU is set to impose new sanctions on Russian oil majors Rosneft, Transneft and Gazpromneft, but will continue to buy oil from them. That's according to sources. The three companies are already subject to tough EU restrictions on loans and debt financing. Under the new package, sources said they will also face an investment ban and be subjected to a transaction ban, which would block investments and other transfers of financial resources to them. But in a sign of European concerns about the impact of sanctions on oil prices and supplies, governments insisted on clarifying that the new measures would not prevent EU states and companies from buying oil from the affected firms. That's in contrast with the US, which last week banned oil imports from Russia, sparking a jump in crude prices. The US, however, does not import as much gas from Russia as the EU. The source said that many EU governments requested carve-outs that would allow their companies to pay bills to the Russian majors and continue buying their oil. That request reportedly led to a slight delay in the approval of the new sanctions, which had been initially submitted for approval on Sunday. The EU's top diplomats are set to discuss and approve the amended proposal later on Monday. The same day saw oil prices drop as much as 7.5 per cent on hopes for progress in peace talks between Ukraine and Russia. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Russia is cut off from major global financial markets due to sanctions. The country may default on its debt if it fails to make interest payments on dollar-denominated bonds. The IMF's managing director pointed out default is no longer improbable. Now under unprecedented sanctions over its invasion of Ukraine, it's widely expected that Russia might default on its debts as soon as this month. According to J.P. Morgan, Moscow has dollar-denominated bond payments due this Wednesday of a combined 177 million U.S. dollars. And neither of the two contracts gives Russia the option of paying in rubles. Technically, Moscow has a 30-day grace period on the payments, but with expectations low, both bonds are trading at roughly 20 cents on the dollar. Russia has been signaling that the only way it's going to make the payments is in rubles, which is tantamount to a default. If it fails to make a payment, it would mark its first international default since the Bolshevik Revolution over a century ago. IMF Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva said on Sunday in an interview with CBS that the IMF no longer thinks Russian default is improbable in terms of servicing debt obligations. Also, she said the war in Ukraine will likely lower global economic growth. So, uh, to sum it up, we have tragic impact of the war on Ukraine. We have contraction uh, on a significant uh, basis in uh, Russia. And we see the likely impact on our world economic outlook we will come up with uh, next month uh, to be a downward revision of our growth projections. However, she said a Russian default will not trigger a global crisis for now since the exposure of global banks to Russia at around $120 billion is not significant. Meanwhile, following decisions by credit card giants Visa and MasterCard to block Russian financial institutions from their payment network, South Korean credit card companies have announced that they're suspending their own services in Russia. To minimize the impact on Korean businesses, the South Korean government from Tuesday will take on guarantees for debts held by small and medium businesses affected by the Russia-Ukraine crisis. 
The Australian court overturned a groundbreaking ruling from last year that required the country's environment minister to consider harm to children from climate change as part of the approval process for a coal mine. Young environmental activists in Australia comforted each other outside a Sydney courtroom on Tuesday as the country's federal court overturned a landmark ruling on climate change. That ruling came last year when the country's environmental minister approved the expansion of a coal mine in New South Wales. The court found then that the minister had a duty to consider the growing impact of climate change on Australian children's futures when making those decisions. But the court reversed that ruling Tuesday, saying that the environmental minister couldn't be held personally liable for the effects of global warming. Australia is one of the world's largest coal exporters, and carbon emissions from burning coal at the mine would add up to an estimated 100 million tonnes. Anti-coal climate activists slammed Tuesday's ruling, which comes in the wake of unprecedented flooding on the country's east coast. Meanwhile, the environmental minister welcomed the decision and says the government remains committed to environmental protections. A high court in India's Karnataka state has ruled that the hijab is not essential to Islam in a landmark case that could have implications across the country. The court also upheld a state government order that had banned headscarves in classrooms. The verdict follows a months-long divisive row over the hijab. A Karnataka college decision in January to bar entry to Muslim girls wearing the hijab had sparked protests. The issue soon snowballed, forcing the state to shut schools and colleges for several days. The matter reached the high court after some Muslim Muslim women protesters filed petitions arguing that India's constitution guaranteed them the right to wear headscarves. The court dismissed these pleas saying that the state government had the right to prescribe uniforms for students. Ahead of the verdict, Karnataka authorities announced closures of schools and colleges and imposed restrictions on public gatherings in some parts of the state to prevent potential trouble. Now on an update on the COVID crisis, China posted a steep jump in daily COVID-19 infections, with new cases more than doubling from a day earlier to a two-year high as virus outbreak expanded rapidly in the country's northeast. Hundreds queued to be tested for COVID-19 in northeast China as the country battles its biggest surge in cases since Wuhan in 2020. More than 3,500 new infections were reported on Monday. The majority were found here in northeast Jilin province. Home to 24 million people, they have now been banned from travelling in and out of the province without notifying local police. In the past week, new COVID cases have been reported in Beijing and the financial hub Shanghai, where schools, parks and cinemas have been closed and long-distance travel suspended. China's aviation regulator said that more than 100 international flights scheduled to arrive in the city will be diverted to other places. Further south in the city of Shenzhen, China's Silicon Valley, officials have temporarily suspended public transport and urged people to work from home. The worsening outbreak is testing President Xi Jinping's zero-COVID strategy. While China's caseload is still tiny by global standards, health experts say the next few weeks will be crucial. They will determine whether, in the face of the rapidly spreading Omicron variant, China can get on top of this latest outbreak. Now, China's efforts to curb its largest COVID-19 outbreak in two years has forced companies, including Apple supplier Foxconn and automakers Toyota and Volkswagen, to suspend some operations, raising concerns over supply chain disruptions. Shares of Apple fell Monday morning after Foxconn, one of its major suppliers in China, said it's suspending operations amid rising COVID-19 cases. China is struggling to contain its largest coronavirus outbreak in two years, the lockdown in Shenzhen, a Chinese manufacturing and tech hub, raised concerns over more potential supply chain disruptions, and it comes just days after Apple announced a new slate of products, including a low-priced iPhone model. Chinese officials have suspended public transportation in Shenzhen and urged people to work at home this week, as the country reported more COVID-19 cases so far this year than it recorded in all of 2021. Foxconn, formerly known as Hanhai Precision Industries, said its Shenzhen operations would be suspended until further notice, adding it would deploy backup plants to reduce disruption. Unimicron Technology, which also supplies Apple, said it too had suspended operations in Shenzhen. Apple did not immediately respond to a request for comment.
Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The Rolling Stones will embark on a European tour this summer, playing stadiums and arenas to mark their 60th anniversary as a band. Fans can expect a set list of Stones classics. NASA said that there are no signs of tension between US and Russian crew members aboard the International Space Station amid Russian invasion of Ukraine. US car maker Ford unveiled plans for seven new electric models in Europe, a battery assembly site in Germany and a nickel cell manufacturing joint venture in Turkey as part of a major electric vehicle push on the continent. Australia and the Netherlands said they began joint legal action against Russia, the UN's aviation agency, over the downing of flight MH17 on July 17, 2014, killing all 298 on board. The number of reservations for international flights booked in Korea has soared since the government announced that it's doing away with mandatory quarantine on arrival. From March 11th, when the change was announced through the 13th, the number of international flights booked was up 873% compared to the same period a year earlier. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you've missed any of the stories we had tonight, you can rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash other than English. We're leaving you tonight with a look at 11,000 competitors from 40 nations lined up to take part in the 52nd Engadin Ski Marathon in Switzerland. Thank you for watching. Good night.